Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar on uh, oil and gas legislation in 2016. I'm happy that you could join us. Thank you for making a little time today to look at what's going on with this important topic. Um, I am Karen Suhaka. I will be presenting today. I will be what passes for an oil and gas expert uh, presentation. And we've got Michael O'Brien on the line as well. Say hello to everybody, Michael. Good morning. Michael will be our legislative expert and help us put in perspective what is similar with oil and gas legislation to other industries and where there are some differences. So with that, let's dive in. Um, today we are going to look at the, a little bit of background so that we can all be on the same page. Then we will take a close look at hydraulic fracturing since that's such a hot topic. Um, we'll look a little bit at the technology and how it works, but just a couple minutes. I'll assume you're mostly familiar with that. And then we'll dive into the legislation. Then I'm going to take a look through legislation that's been passed in the last five years. We'll look at an overview of all of that, and we will um, dive in and look at some specific bills that I've pulled out that I thought were interesting. And then finally, we'll wrap up by looking for trends across all of that and see what we can predict about the future. So a little bit of oil industry background. Um, the first well was drilled by Colonel Drake in 1859 in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you're not allowed to do an oil and gas presentation without a picture of the Drake number one. So there's the first well. Uh, since then, four and a half million wells or so have been drilled in the United States. About half of those were productive, and probably somewhat more than half of those have been, in fact, fracked um, with hydraulic fracturing, which started back in the 1940s. I've also got a little time chart down here of uh, how many wells were drilled per year. And you can see that about 50,000 wells on average per year. Um, in the 80s, that was up to almost 100,000 wells per year. Um, and you can also see the impact of the financial crisis right there. So that's what we're looking at, a whole lot of wells. Uh, also important is where those wells are. So this is a map of where oil and gas wells are in the United States. Uh, green is oil, red is gas, but most wells produce both, um, and most wells produce water as well. So of course, Texas has lots of wells. We all know that, but they actually go all the way up through the Rockies and into Canada. Um, California has lots of oil and gas. Alaska doesn't have as many wells, but they're big producers. Um, and then we do have production back in, in New York and West Virginia, Kentucky, um, off through the Appalachians. Uh, what you'll notice is there's not much production along the East Coast, uh, and there's no production in Hawaii. So that sets the stage for how different states maybe look at oil and gas, um, whether or not they have very much production. So keep this map in mind as we go through. Um, okay, so now about hydraulic fracturing. First, I want to give a very, very quick geology lesson. Uh, as you know, biomass, dinosaurs and plants and stuff, generally in seabeds, get swooshed into shale, uh, which produces oil and gas, and it migrates up to the surface. If it, gets, if it hits an impermeable layer and it gets trapped, maybe we're lucky enough that there's a big sandstone um, rock formation to hold it, then we have a reservoir, and that will be an oil or gas field. Uh, conventionally, we used to drill straight down into that sandstone and produce it. Uh, what's not shown very well in this picture is the sandstone tends to be tens or hundreds of feet thick, uh, whereas the shale is only maybe feet thick. So we could never produce the um, shale because when you vertically go through it, you're not in contact with it for very long. But with the advent of horizontal drilling technology, we're able to actually drill down, go sideways, and stay in that formation. And you'll drill along a shale for 5,000 feet or more, so that you can stay right in there for a mile long. Um, that is one major change that has let us start producing uh, from shale instead of just from the sandstone reservoir. Um, as far as what fracturing is, in particular, when you drill a well, um, then you can pump water down under high pressure to create cracks to radiate out from the well bore. The gas can travel to your well bore. But if you have um, fra uh, fractures radiating out, the oil and gas can get to those fractures and then flow into your reservoir. Of course, when you release the pressure from the water, the cracks will close. So we also pump uh, sand down with the water so that when the fractures close, they close on the sand, and that props the fractures open. Um, therefore, the water generally has something in it to make it a little thicker to carry the sand. It'll have other additives, maybe iron inhibitors, things like that. Um, so the water is mostly water, but it has a little bit of chemicals in it and also sand. And that's what we refer to altogether as frac fluid. Um, OK, so with sandstone, that's relatively permeable, so oil can travel pretty well. With shale, it's not permeable at all. Um, oil and gas can't move in it, so you really, really have to have these fractures. 
So with the long length of the well and the fact that we need lots of fractures to get them to produce, that has, we are doing higher and higher volume treatments, which I think is part of why this has now come to national attention um, to the public, even though we've been doing it since the 40s, um, by we I mean humanity, um, <laughs> not me personally, but since it's been happening since the 40s, uh, but recently the volumes have been getting much bigger, um, orders of magnitude bigger, and so that's why I think this is now in the news. So with that background, um, we, had, we know what the cons are. We are concerned about our environment. We are concerned about um, contaminating groundwater. We are concerned about cl climate change. All of those things um, are valid concerns. But to look at the pros of it, here is the change in oil production. Um, so this article, this pie chart comes from an NPR article I found, and I think the data is actually probably from a little bit before 2012. But this is how much oil we produce for ourselves and, and where the rest of our oil came from. Um, with the shale boom, quite stunning how much more oil we're producing for ourselves. So besides the economic benefit, think about the geopolitical um, advantages of producing our own, own oil um, and maybe not relying on other countries as much. Uh, so that is another pro I wanted to put out. So we have our pros, we have our cons, both of which are significant, both of which are valid, and that is what the states are struggling with. So all of the states and our country have to balance these things and try to figure out a way through that makes sense. That's what we're about to tackle. So hydraulic fracturing legislation. Um, before I get into the legislation, Michael, any questions about that background? You feel good? You feel like you know what we're talking about? As, as a non-oil industry expert, I feel pretty good about the background. Okay, so off we go. Um, and everyone listening, feel free to register a question at any time. Michael will be wrangling questions. You can interrupt me and I can cover anything in more depth. Um, we'll also have some time at the end. I intend to end right on time, just like we started right on time. Um, but we will have time at the end for questions. So you can either interrupt us or you can wait till the end. Totally up to you as to what you think your question merits. Okay, so map of uh, where legislation has been introduced. So this map, uh, two things might jump out at you. First, uh, New York seems to have an awful lot of bills introduced uh, compared to other states. And also, lots of states along the East Coast are introducing legislation, although as we looked at, they don't really have very many producing or not any producing oil wells. Um, so if you'd like to see a version of this map where it's interactive and you can click on your own state, you can go here. Um, also, I have a handout which is posted. If you can figure out how to get that off a of go-to meeting, you should have a handout section where you can grab these slides. Um, or you can go to Bill Track 50, go to our blog, and the most recent blog entry has all of this information in it and an interactive version of this map. So you can get to these bills many different ways. Okay, so looking at this map, uh, New York obviously stands out. So I wanted to show this as well to give you a little bit of context. Um, this is how many bills are introduced in each state each year. And you can see New York stands out again as having a lot of bills introduced. So blue is introduced, orange is crossed over, meaning made it to the other chamber and has a chance at passing, and green is passed. So you can see that although New York introduces more bills than anyone, by no means do they pass more bills than everyone. So keep in mind what the different states are like uh, when you're looking at the bills to try to estimate if you think a bill is going to pass. Uh, Michael, what, what's special about New York? Why are they like that? Uh, New York has uh, has an automatic. Um, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? They they will automatically drop bills um, even if they died the the last session. So uh, bills continue to be reintroduced year after year. Uh, I'm convinced sometimes even after the original sponsors have have left the chamber. So. Uh, that's why okay. New York has a significant number of bills every year. So this is big, huge, cumulative zombie situation. Um, great. So that's uh, certainly serves to obscure what they're really caring about, but there you go. Um, so keep all of this in mind um, when you're looking at the bills. But what the hydraulic fracturing bills are actually about. So I took them all and I put them into categories. And several of them were about where to get um, water for fracking. Um, lots of them were about what to do with wastewater after fracking. Um, we had a lot of bills about transparency, and in that I lumped bills demanding that oil companies uh, share the information, the chemicals in their frac fluid, and tell the public what that's about. There's also some bills about um, posting information about when they're going to be drilling and where and what treatments will be used. So everything about informing the public I put into transparency. 
Uh, that has been going on for years um, as hydraulic fracturing has become more contentious. There have been lots and lots of bills uh, introduced and passed uh, demanding a certain amount of transparency so that the public can know what's going on. Um, another thing that stands out are these bans. And in this section ban, I threw in moratoriums and also bans on certain procedures or certain chemicals. Um, so they're not all outright frac bans. But there are fewer bans proposed this year than there have been in years past, so that is actually waning, uh, whereas dealing with water seems to be increasing. So let's look at some specific bills. Um, one topic I noticed in particular was the fight over who's in control. So I pulled out some bills to highlight this, this fight. So for example, Ohio has a bill uh, uh, requiring local uh, approval. Texas has several bills saying that um, municipalities and, can and counties can't ban fracking, only the state can decide that. Uh, Michigan has a specific bill saying that um, counties and townships can ban fracking. Um, Oklahoma had a bill saying that counties can regulate some things, but they can't ban fracking. Um, Utah and North Dakota a few years ago both said that even if Congress bans fracking, they don't care, they're still going to do it. Um, and a couple of cities in Colorado last year did ban fracking, and it went to the Supreme Court of Colorado, and the Supreme Court said no you can't ban fracking. So uh, you see there's no consensus over who should be in control. Um, also, I had a couple related bills that I want to highlight. So Texas and Oklahoma both passed bills this year calling on Congress to end the ban on exporting crude. So they're saying this is our natural resources. We want to decide what to do with it, not the federal government. Um, and North Dakota has a bill about how they're going to reach agreement with taxes um, on oil from tribe lands, so dealing with basically sovereign nations. Uh, so just up and down, from states up, from states down, like who's in control. Um, this fight does not seem, this, this will continue. We'll see more bills like this. Michael, what's it like in other industries? Uh, preemption is, is a big issue in a number of, of industries and issues, uh, whether or not uh, localities can ban things in states or uh, whether the federal government can preempt uh, other state laws. It's an issue uh, across a number of issues and not just industry. Uh, you also have social in issues where uh, just uh, just recently in, in North Carolina with the bathrooms where the city of Charlotte said yes and the state came in and said no. You know, that, that happens in, in many industries. Um, I've good worked example. in the West Side and fertilizer industry that and preemption was was a big issue uh, in 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 that industry as well. So, so do we all. expect it will settle down or will the fight just go on? I think the fight will continue to go on, um, especially as localities and states uh, issue statements saying that they don't care what the other government says uh, a lot of a lot of these preemption issues are eventually going to end up in court and they'll you know it'll be up to the courts to to settle okay so, so to some degree the voice of the people matters they can demand these things and then it can go up the chain and see what happens correct Okay, right, so um I find that to be pretty interesting. Some other bills I wanted to highlight um, Michigan has a bill saying that they will lift their moratorium on hydraulic fracturing if uh, a certain list of issues can be worked out if legislation can be passed solving certain problems. And then they introduced bills to solve each one of the problems. So they wanted to look at the impact of water withdrawal, so that's a study. Uh, they wanted uh, to require operators to disclose what's in their frac fluids, so some transparency. Um, they want to make sure the public has a chance to participate and control what's going on. And they also want to talk about setbacks, which is how close you can drill to a school and stuff like that. So I thought it was really interesting, the structure between here's the, here's the main bill. If you can pass these other things, then we will lift the moratorium. Um, but then they broke out the issues into individual bills to argue one at a time. Um, Michael, is that something that you see very often? And what, what are the advantages of doing it that way? Uh, it's not something that I've seen, but the, it, the advantage of it is you give both the legislature and the general public the opportunity to debate each one of those issues, whether they do that through a study committee uh, where they bring in 
experts and talk about the issues or they have public forums or discussion. It increases uh, transparency. It increases uh, the opportunity for the legislature to educate themselves on the issue. Uh, and it, it just broadens the discussion on, on the issue. Uh, so I, I think it's a smart way to do it. Um, but one that I've not necessarily seen before. I've seen... Yeah, and it kind of lets each um, topic pr pr proceed at its own pace. So if something gets hung up and it needs to get passed next year, then that can happen. So I like it. I mean, regardless of the quality of these actual bills and whether they're good or bad bills, I like the framework, so I think that's smart. So I thought that was a really interesting setup. Um, I also wanted to point out this uh, Texas bill, which is... Uh, actually calling for um, alternatives to f using fresh water in flac fl frac fluid. Um, actually, let me just go ahead and click on this bill um, and show you what it says. Um, I'm impressed with this one. So this is Texas mined, so remember what our map looked like, lots of wells. Um, but it's a tax severance credit for oil and gas operators for the use of alternative fleet um, fluids in the place of fresh water. So it is Texas saying, well, let's try a carrot instead of a stick um, for this environmental benefit of using less fresh water. Um, so I think that is interesting that they're putting that up and they're letting um, oil companies figure out how they can meet that goal. They're not telling them what to do, but they're offering them an incentive to try to get it done. So that's uh, just something that Texas did I thought was worth pointing out. And then also um, I pulled out several of the bills that are just flat out banning um, hydraulic fracturing versus some statements of strong support from different legislatures uh, about why hydro or the oil and gas industry is great. So the states that don't have production or don't have very much production, there's a definite tone to the bills. Um, and so let's just give you one little sample here. So I'm going to go into the bill text of this one. Um, so this says the legislature finds uh, the practice of drilling of hydraulic fracturing um, has been found a variety of contaminating chemicals that can suddenly and in an uncontrolled manner be introduced to surface waters. Um, companies engaging in this technique have been less than forthcoming in revealing the cocktail of chemicals, um, et cetera. So you can tell the tone of this, the very distinct um, point of view in this legislature, which fair enough, um, they, you know, they can have their thoughts. Um, whereas if you look at how Texas will write a bill and talk about the oil industry, um, let's look at this bill here. Um, it starts out with uh, natural gas, uh, as far as the advancement of a vital industry that promotes the prosperity and security of our state and nation. So a, definitely a different tone to this bill. So it's not surprising that states with significant production and states with no or little production have a different point of view on that. Um, so no surprise there, but certainly notable. Um, so you might enjoy reading um, each of these and kind of comparing and contrasting, mostly contrasting. Um, how the bills sound from these different states. Um, so I just found that to be interesting. Karen, we, okay, let's move we, on. Have, a, so, we have a question. Uh, are there any patterns emerging between states that support or ban fracturing? In other words, why would Arizona ban it but Texas support it? Uh, it's just, is it just about the number of wells involved within the state? Um, I think it's definitely that would be the primary factor, um, but also sort of their well, a couple other things. Um, the public's opinion and how well they've let that be known, as well as their experience with oil and gas. So we will get to um, a California example coming up. But I think a lot of it has to do with the impact of the industry, the pros that the industry brings versus the cons that they, that they think it brings. Um, so if you don't have much production, you don't have the pros to outweigh uh, what you see as the, the, the danger to the environment and, and to to public safety. So, you know, it doesn't cost New Jersey anything, in fact, to ban this, but they get some political capital from it, basically, if that's fair to say. Um, did that, hopefully that answered the question a little bit. Um, the patterns, though, are even in states where they do have production, there's a lot of concern about how to dispose of wastewater. And so, kind of all of the states are grappling with what about the use of fresh water and what about the use of wastewater. Um, so that pattern is emerging very strongly this year and last year. Water has become a major focus. Um, so I'd say that's a definite pattern that we will see more of. Um, and we'll talk about that again in the trends. Um, 
Okay, so moving on to oil and gas legislation that's been passed in the last five years. So these are bills that have actually been passed, not just introduced. And again, I've got a link to all the bills. You can go read them. Um, but uh, the thing that struck me about this map is if we compare it to the introduced map from fracturing, and I go back and forth between this, you can see that really it's what states that have a lot of wells and a lot of production are the ones getting into the nitty-gritty of actual um, oil and gas legislation, not hydraulic fracturing, which is a hot topic, but just the, the nuts and bolts of like how to regulate the industry. Um, so I thought that was a little bit interesting. Um, moving on, I, these are the search terms I use to find these bills. So these bills are about you know oil and gas or oil wells or pipelines, etc. Um, so those are the topics I chose to highlight. I took all of those bills and broke them into these categories. And the main thing you'll see here is there are a lot of bills about oversight, funding commissions, um, doing studies, all sorts of just oversight of the industry. Um, lot, and also bills about plugging and permitting, which you could also consider oversight. So lots of that, like just keeping an eye on everything. Um, also bills to do with what to do with all the money coming in. Um, that's a very popular topic that I think they like to talk about. Um, so those are sort of the areas that we're seeing a lot of legislation. And again, you can go look at all of the bills and look at any of these categories and see the, the bills in them if you like. Um, keep in mind, these are bills that have passed, so this is actual work getting done. Um, I want to pull out some specific bills to look at. So I've got two that are sort of supportive of the industry and two that are less supportive of the industry. Um, Pennsylvania had a bill proposing, uh, or they passed a bill saying that mines can provide mine wastewater um, for oil and gas companies to use in fracking by reducing the liability to the mine for what happens with that water. So that seems like a really smart idea to me. So reducing the reliance on fresh water um, by letting one industry share water with another industry and not have to use fresh water. Um, whether you're pro or con on this, um, Pennsylvania figuring out um, a way to make it better uh, is seems like a win. So. Good way to go, Pennsylvania. Um, Oklahoma had a bill requiring agencies to start working on uh, ways to deal with produced water, so not water from fracking, but rather water that's produced along with oil or along with gas um, from wells. And that water has been, you know, in contact with oil for millions of years, so it's not it's not nice water. Um, but they're saying, you know, if you can find an industry that needs it, and then that reduces reliance of fresh water for that industry, then that's a win as well. So a way to take what is happening in oil and gas and use that as a way to reduce environmental impact for another industry, which I thought was also pretty interesting. Um, so good luck. This is just the start of this. There's no specific technology suggested, so we'll, it'll be fun to see what they come up with in case it's clever like what Pennsylvania did. Um, Hawaii, uh, on the other hand, has a bill. So this bill states very clearly that uh, they believe that use of fossil fuels leads to climate change, and they believe Hawaii is particularly vulnerable to climate change. So fair enough, um, but I, I feel like Hawaii gets to say that. So they also say that they don't think oil and gas investments are, are financially prudent, and they have a couple thing, reasons in the bill for why they think that's true. So they are proposing that they divest their um, pension plans from oil and gas stocks. So they're looking at, they're, this is a study to say, well, how would that have impacted us last year, and, and do we want to go ahead and do that? So I feel like that's well within, you know, that's Hawaii's prerogative. If they don't want to spend money to support the uh, industry because they think they're going to sink the island, um, then, then they should definitely divest. Um, California has this bill declaring a moratorium on injecting gas in Aliso Canyon. So quick background about gas storage. Uh, natural gas is used a lot for heat, uh, so we use more of it in the winter and less of it in the summer, but we produce it at a constant rate all year long. So we've got to take all the gas we produce in the winter and store it somewhere so that we can then, sorry, in the summer, so that we can then use it in the winter. Where we store it is generally depleted gas fields so that have certain favorable conditions like their location and the properties of the, of the rock and so forth. So we'll inject gas into those fields um, and store it there, and then it's easy to produce and put back into the system when we need it later. So Aliso Canyon was one such field where they were injecting gas and storing it. Unfortunately, one of the wells, uh, wells sprung a leak. This was last October, and they didn't get it under control until February. And in between October and February, it was venting unimaginable, like really you can't get your mind around how much gas they vented to the atmosphere. It's 
at least as bad a disaster as Deepwater Horizon. And they have the same problems killing it. You know, anything they put down the well to try to stop it, just blown right back out because the gas is coming out at such a fast rate. Um, enormous environmental disaster. Really affected the surrounding communities. Just bad. Um, so California reasonably said, OK, we're going to stop that. However, Aliso Canyon it provides the backup energy for Los Angeles. So without their storage facilities, which are used, um, they're going to have brownouts. They're going to have a lot of trouble um, with the you know bumps or sp spikes in the demand for energy. So this, to me, is a situation where we're really looking at the, the enormous environmental impact that oil and gas can have, as well as the benefits that oil and gas has, just crystallized into one very uh, difficult situation. So California's got this mess that they're going to have to figure out what to do. They can't let Los Angeles go without power, but you know, they, can't let the, you know, they can't let a disaster like that happen again. What are they going to do? I feel like this is a bellwether, bellwether sort of situation. So seeing how California manages this awful, awful mess uh, will be instructive for maybe what we're all going to, how we're, the whole world's going to deal with it. So terrible situation, um, and they've got a series of bills about it. This is the one just initially declaring the moratorium. Interesting situation, um, also a bit terrifying. Michael, any <laughs> contribution to this awful topic? Um, no, but I... I am curious. I, I mean, I know I know Aliso Canyon hasn't gotten the publicity as you know the the Gulf disaster, um, but do you think that the learnings that they can take from whatever happens in Aliso Canyon Canyon can translate into legislation in other states? I absolutely do. Um, so obviously, storage happens all over. Um, especially back east. So yes, what we learn here and what California figures out um, as far as safety guidelines and things like that may be very, very helpful um, in the future. And I hope that it just does, doesn't turn out to be punishing that one company. Um, there's obviously allegations that mistakes were made. Fair enough. If punishment is deserved, it should be meted out. However, I hope it goes beyond that and is more proactive than that. Um, and then yes, hopefully this can help us just kind of grapple with this, the, 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 the pros and cons, right? This, what are we going to do? Um, okay, so moving on to overall trends that I saw. Uh, I've been talking about that a little bit, but let's review. So lots of oversight and lots of transparency, um, and more and more around water. And I think we'll see, we'll see that continue um, as water becomes ever more precious, and we're using more and more of it in fracking. Um, creative ways to deal with that, uh, or creative ways to mitigate the environmental impact in general. Um, I love seeing these bills. I've seen more of them now, um, and hopefully that will continue. Uh, obviously, mitigating environmental impact is in everybody's interest. Uh, and then, as that's the cons, the pros, obviously the economic impact, um, lots of creative ways that they're directing that, that states are thinking of to direct that back at the environment or helping their citizens. Um, I put that a couple examples. Kansas uh, had a bill last year using some of the funds to pay for gauges to help manage the Arkansas River. Uh, North Dakota had a fund. Um, actually, lots of states have funds uh, where they just put money aside for remediation in case anything goes wrong. Um, there's money set aside to help with it, um, just funded by the oil industry. Uh, New York had a bill this year, which probably won't pass, um, but requiring 10% of oil and gas produced using fracking to be contributed to a state reserve. So not the money being contributed, but the oil itself being contributed. So um, as we were just talking about, like, where are they going to put all that oil? Um, interesting idea, but it would give the state a reserve. Um, West Virginia had a bill um, asking the oil industry to make sure that they hire people from West Virginia and educate them in directional drilling. Totally within bounds, West Virginia. Um, that's their prerogative. You know, if you guys are going to do this, let's hire West Virginians. Um, and then this North Dakota bill, which mostly I'm pulling out because it seems so random to me. Um, so in counties that have oil and gas production, they're requiring oil and gas companies to set aside a fund to help hospitals with rape, with rape crisis centers. Um, so that's just, you know, you've got some money. Why don't you give it to some people who need it? Um, okay. Uh, 
North Dakota wants that, and they passed it. So there you go. Um, we, we so have more and more. Yes. Uh, someone asked, in passing such bills, do corporations get involved? That is, do they have an effect on the bill itself, i.e., the moratorium? It put uh, plenty of companies probably out of business, but it opened the door in the solutions to other companies. Uh, do these companies influence the bills themselves, or are they just victims to the bills put forth by legislation? Great question, um, and I love the uh, opening the doors aspect as well when you're requiring um, studies or technologies or cleaning stuff up. That is obviously opportunities for others. Michael, I'm going to throw that one to you. <laughs> uh, Sure, that's uh, that is my area of expertise. Companies do get involved in in policy all the time, um, both in playing defense against bills that are going to hurt their business, uh, but lots of playing offense and and getting favorable legislation and regulations that uh, help them do business or you know level the playing field, especially if you're a small business or startup. Or if you're, you know, pushing, pushing a new idea that's not not necessarily been tested, uh, you might need legislation or or regulation that allows you to actually do that. So some of these some of these solutions might need actual uh, legislative or regulatory changes to allow those companies to to implement those businesses, and they certainly get involved. Um, you know, with their with their lobbying and advocacy, advocacy. Sure. So, like the Pennsylvania mine water one was a, it was reducing liability on mine companies, which they may have felt like they needed before they could actually do that. So, yeah, good point. Like sometimes you just need the legislation to even move forward. Um, all right. So that actually does bring us to our question section. Uh, any other questions that anybody has about? Uh, the, the current situation, oil and gas in general, um, how a bill is passed, anything at all? Uh, I've got a question. We've seen some interesting trends in legislation surrounding these over the past few years. Do these trends translate into significant changes in drilling and fracking operations, or is it more the case that states where the oil and gas production drives the economy, simply find ways around the regulations and continue producing? Oh, good question. Um, certainly the transparency bills have had an impact in the sense that they have allowed the public to become more informed about exactly what's going on where and when um, and what chemicals are involved. Um, whether or not it's, well, and I would say that there have been a lot of regulations around emissions and things like that that have definitely um, had a positive impact on air quality. Um, whether it slows down drilling, um, if your goal is to slow down drilling, well, certain states have, have declared moratoriums and there haven't been any, um, but those aren't, like, that's not Texas, right, and that's not Louisiana or Oklahoma. So yes, some impact for sure. Uh, dramatic impact in uh, reducing the amount of drilling, no. In reducing the impact of drilling, a little bit. So, um, and obviously oil companies are made up of people who also breathe air and drink water, so it's in their interest as well to look after our planet. So I think um, bills where you're, you're finding positive ways to, to deal with things and making that easier for them to do uh, are welcomed by the industry as well. So to that degree, yes, I think there have been some impacts um, that you can actually point to that these bills have, have um, resulted in. So the oil companies don't get to get away with just anything. Any other questions? Okay, great. Well, I hope that you found this presentation interesting and helpful. Um, I'm happy that you could join us. We have, as I mentioned, you can grab this presentation from the handouts bar if you can find it, or drop me a note. Um, here's our contact information, and I will send you a copy of the presentation, or you can go to BillTrack50.com, go to our blog, um, and here's a link to it, but you can just go to the blog 
and you'll see the oil and gas post is right at the top. And it'll have all of these bills, interactive maps that you can look at, um, you can read the bills and, and whatnot. Um, so hopefully you can use that as a resource if you'd like to read more about this. So thanks, everybody. Um, have a great day. Thank you. Do you want to say goodbye, Michael? Goodbye. <laughs> Bye.